Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship together at Shawnee Park Christian Reformed Church. Welcome to those of you who are here in person and also to those of you who are worshiping with us via the live stream today. I just want to start by noting kind of where we are in the annual cycle of the church's calendar. This is the last Sunday before the beginning of Lent. Uh, that means we're in the last Sunday of what could be called Epiphany Tide, uh, sometimes the season of Epiphany. And it means a couple things that I wanted to highlight. One is that this coming Wednesday will be Ash Wednesday. The start of Lent starts on a Wednesday, 40 days prior uh, to Holy Week, and uh, Good, Good Friday and Easter. Um, so that's on a Wednesday, and we're going to have two opportunities to gather in worship on Wednesday. One, an 8 o'clock a.m. service here, and then another at 6.30 in the evening. Um, those service will be fairly short, going through some readings, um, confession of sin, self-examination, but then also receiving the imposition of ashes. Um, some of you have experienced that before. For some, it might be a new thing. We'll talk about that in that service, but that's our plan to have two opportunities, 8 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. Invite you to join for either of those. It's an identical service. You probably don't want to come to both and you, unless you just really, really love it and want to come back a second time. But then uh, for today, what that means is the last Sunday before Lent is Transfiguration Sunday. We're not focusing today on the story of Jesus' transfiguration, but we are going to open with it as our call to worship, as we hear that story of Jesus' journey up the mountain where he was transfigured before his disciples and revealed in his glory. The Gospels tell of Jesus' transfiguration, a pinnacle moment of epiphany, a revelation of his glory. Hear the story. Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There, Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. A bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. Listen. <laughs> Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And so God calls us this day to behold and listen to his son, to bow our lives before him in worship, and to not be afraid as we seek to worship and follow him. Thanks, Rebecca and Elias, for introducing our worship and calling us to worship through God's word with that. We're going to respond together. I invite you, if you would, to rise as able as we respond. Uh, first, receive God's greeting. Dear friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one revealed in glory on the mountain, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit all be yours. Amen and amen. Come, let's worship God together in song.
Here again today from, uh, from Jesus' parable of the sower, calling us to self-examination and confession of our sin. Jesus said, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Join me now in this prayer of confession, beginning together. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for the good seed, the message of your kingdom, so give to us through your word and by your spirit. We confess that sometimes we do not understand it. Like a trodden path, our minds and hearts do not receive well your difficult and beautiful truths. The evil one snatches the word away before it can even take root. We confess that at times we receive the word with joy, but in our rocky lives and world, it cannot get much root. Our faith is shallow, and trouble and persecution causes us to quickly fall away. Our faith withers without deeper roots. And we confess that oftentimes your word falls among choking thorns. The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke your good word, and it bears so little fruit. Our own lives remain little changed, and we, our ability to share and multiply our faith in the world, is so diminished. We are, we are humbled by your teaching, Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us, forgive and restore us. Make us, individually and together, better soil. Till and loosen the soils of our hearts, remove the rocks, pull the weeds, so that we might receive afresh and anew your life-giving word this very day. Open the eyes and ears of our hearts. Friends, if we have confessed Christ as Lord, and if we have prayed sincerely those prayers of confession, then we should also hear the good news in Jesus' parable. Jesus said, still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. The seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop. And Jesus said, whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. We continue in song.
Our giving opportunities today are for the wonderful ministries here at Shawnee, but also for Safe Haven Ministries. We're going to switch things up a little bit and uh, try something new in 2023. I don't know if you noticed, we didn't do a reverse food offering for Thanksgiving. What we did instead was the angel tree for Christmas. And uh, we, as deacons, decided to try um, doing something in a different time. So now is the time. Uh, today's basket uh, in the back will be for checks and cash towards Safe Haven. But in a couple weeks, uh, we are going to have slips of paper. Actually, we're going to have slips of paper today. But uh, you can return items uh, that are needed by Safe Haven in the next couple weeks. There will be a table in the back. Um, some of these items include spring cleaning products, just cleaning for the, the facilities. Um, gift cards are a, a big must because uh, the women come in and need, you know, pajamas or things like that. So I think it's uh, a bit easier to do gift cards um, so the staff knows what kind of sizing and things that they need. So um, we're going to be doing that. If, you, uh, if we surpass all of those, then I'll publish more in the SFB. Uh, and we can continue to keep giving that way. So, um, like I said, pre please bring items back by uh, the 25th of February. Uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to give. Give us open hearts to give to the families in need who are using the wonderful resources of Safe Haven. And thank you for the wonderful uh, ministries here at Shawnee and uh, Help them to continue to flourish. The drop-in centers, they uh, continue to have kids each week uh, drop in and, and play games and study and uh, all the other ministries too. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue in prayer um, in just a moment. I wanted to make mention um, that following the service today, we'll have a brief um, meeting. This is regarding the plans to host a preschool here in our church building and um, starting next fall, but it involves uh, approval and plans that are ongoing. So uh, for all members of Shawnee Park, please, please join us for that um, probably fairly short meeting, but um, hopefully everyone can join for that. I um, also wanted to note um, what you may have read in this week's SFB, and that is the diagnosis of ovarian cancer that Mary Jane Van Lu has received. Uh, treatments have already begun for that over the last couple weeks. There's been um, various tests and scans, um, and then treatment, first round of chemo was administered um, Friday already. I want to pray for Ken and Mary Jane and Travis and their family as they um, begin what will no doubt be a, um, a challenging journey through cancer treatment. Along with other needs, um, we are praying today uh, for them. I'm going to pray uh, utilizing a prayer that comes out of the Lift Up Your Hearts hymnal called the Prayer for the Mission of the Church as part of the prayer here today. But let's join our hearts together in prayer. Almighty Father, we bless and worship your holy name this day. We join our voices to the saints and angels and indeed all creation as it sings your praise. For you are worthy, O God. And if we do not worship you, we are prone to worship other and lesser things, robbing you of what you are due and robbing us, robbing our very selves of enduring joy. We bless you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain for us and for our salvation, the one who took upon himself the sins of the world. We give thanks for that moment of glory and transfiguration up on the mountain. We give thanks for the witness and the presence of Moses and Elijah and for the voice that spoke saying, this is my son, listen to him. We bless you, holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our brother in the flesh, our savior, the lamb who was slain, our Lord, we marvel that he called women and men, boys and girls, Jews and Gentiles, all to be part of his new people. We thank you for Christ's call to us that we would renounce sin and resist the devil and all the works of darkness. We thank you that Jesus Christ called us to be salt and light in the world. And we recall the charge he gave to go and make disciples from every nation and to teach them to obey all that 
we have been commanded. How grateful we are for your promise to never leave us or forsake us in the fulfilling of this great, great mission. For we can do none of these things in our strength or with our own resources. We are not wealthy enough or powerful enough or smart enough or focused enough or just fundamentally loving enough. But with your help and by your spirit, we are here to receive your word and to spread it. So as we seek to plant the seed of your word and to water the seed once planted, teach us to trust and to testify that you are the source of all growth. Help us to resist any and every message we receive that contrasts or contradicts what you have said to us through Jesus Christ. As the seed of your word is planted in our hearts, help us to be good soil, receptive to all that you desire for us to know, to love, and to do. As we gather and worship this day, or as we read and reflect on a devotional book, or as we memorize scripture, or as we gather in times of Bible study, or as we listen to audio versions of scripture and sermons, and all these ways and more, plant your word deep in us. May it really grab and hold and take root and grow and bear fruit. Help us to never merely listen to the word, but to do what it says. In that spirit today, we hear Christ's call to us to be a prayerful people, to pray for the needs of the church and the world, and to bear one another's burdens in love and in prayer. And so we continue our prayers today for Derek Sherman and his family and the recent passing of Karina's father, the waves of grief that they have sustained in recent months. Lord, uphold them and comfort them by your strength and by your grace. We pray for Becky Borman and Craig Vandervliet and Rita Cunningham and Dee Holden, each dealing with situations of health that need your loving and healing touch. And we pray in particular today for Ken and Mary Jane and for Travis and their family as they begin a difficult path of cancer treatment. Lord, have mercy. Make these treatments powerfully effective. Reduce the size and spread of the cancer in Mary Jane's body. And restore her, we pray, in good time to health and strength. And through it all, give them your presence and your peace. Father, we pray for all the ministries of our church, including this day, the discernment we're facing regarding hosting a preschool here in the building. With all the logistics and planning and arrangements required, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom about this possible way to love our neighbors and use the resources you've given us. Give us wisdom to know what is good and right and true and to follow your spirit's leading. We continue our prayers this week for the church in Myanmar, having heard some more of the stories of what life is like there for so many people, including many brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for the many who continue to endure uh, flight from violence, who have to endure reports of horrific who have to endure reports of horrific violence committed and loved ones lost and homes and villages burned or bombed. Lord, have mercy and bring, bring peace to that land and other regions of conflict too. We pray for peace throughout your troubled world, even as we continue to see and bear witness to the widespread suffering, corruption, and the ways in which humanity seems bent on war. Unbend us, Lord, and bring us your peace. O oh God, by your spirit, increase our love and knowledge and depth of insight so that we may always discern what is best and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus to the glory and praise of you, our God and Father. All this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to turn then to the Gospel of Matthew once again, and I would invite you again, if you would, to, to turn to, in the Bible to Matthew chapter 13. We're reading from uh, the second parable on page 794. 794 in the Pew Bibles, or you can turn to it, whatever means you have in front of you. It will not again be on the screen. I'm still messing with you on that point. 
couple of weeks back, we looked at the first parable of the sower in Matthew 13, and today we're reading and looking at something of a sequel parable. So Matthew 13, starting at verse 24, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Skip down a few verses then to verse 36, where Jesus gives an explanation of this parable. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you ask around about movies, you'll find that the consensus view seems to be that sequels stink. Very often, not always, but sequels often stink. Um, what happens seems to be something like this. Uh, a movie is made, good movie, good acting, uh, compelling storytelling, a world is created that people find fascinating, and people love the movie. And since they love the movie, the movie does well at the box office, and it makes a whole heap of money. And what happens seems to be then is that um, Hollywood executives get a hold of that idea, and boy, they can't let it go. And they think, boy, it would be really nice to do that again. So they reboot the thing. They don't have to come up with a whole new story or new actors. They just have to sort of take the original and give it some kind of twist. They try to franchise it and multiply it out, but very often... It fails, it falls flat, it looks like a money grab, it, it comes off the way like bad leftovers in the microwave come off. It's just not like the original. But sometimes, sometimes, maybe especially when the sequel isn't merely an afterthought and a money grab, but sometimes sequels can really sing. They can be not like, um, you know, a hamburger warmed up, but like a good soup a day or two later. And it warms up and it tastes just as good and maybe better with a, a fresh slice of bread. The original is uh, kind of built on in some fresh new way, and it, it could kind of stand on its own, and yet if you knew the original, boy, it, it kind of sings and it has this depth and resonance and goodness to it that makes it all that much better. Well, Jesus tells a sequel parable here. We read, read a couple weeks ago this parable of the, the sower and the seed and the soils. And of the, the sower who goes out sowing seed. And of the seed that grows. And then especially of the soils that come that, where the seed falls. The sower, we said, is Jesus and those who bear his message of the kingdom. The seed is the word, the message of the, the kingdom, the good news of salvation that Jesus 
embodies and proclaims. And then the soils. And we noted how this, this parable can sort of scale. You can apply it in individual ways. You can look at your own heart and see how it has these different tendencies about how the word is reset, received. But it can also apply to people as a whole or communities of people. It sort of scales up. How is the message of the kingdom received? And Jesus gives three soils that say, here's various reasons in which the, the message doesn't take. It doesn't flourish. But then here's one. Here's this good soil. And when it hits good soil, this, this thing, as we would say today, it's a message that goes viral. It grows and it spreads abundantly. But I like Jesus' image of a seed spreading better than viral, which has kind of the notion of sickness to it, right? But Jesus' message grows in abundance in the good soil, 160 or 30 times what is sown. Well, to all that very good, deep, rich, abundant parable with all the different ways you can scale it and apply it and think of it, Jesus now brings a sequel. And it's a sequel, I would say, that does not stink. In fact, it kind of nails it. It grabs all the, that background of the original and then adds this other element or a couple other elements that really deepen it and give it even greater resonance. So we get the sower, seed, soil sequel Call it the revenge of the weeds. Prominent in this second version, uh, this sequel version of a parable, is the evil one. Now, there was an evil one in the original parable, if you remember. The evil one, it was said, is, are like those birds that snatch away the seed that was sown along the path. But, you know, in a sense, that seed fallen along the path, like it seemed like it wasn't going to do much good anyway. And the, the work of the birds or the evil one there seems almost incidental but in this parable the work of an enemy is more deliberate and more malicious and more intentional in causing harm there we go verse 25 while everyone was sleeping the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away this is not merely someone pulling a prank this is not merely a competitor down the road sowing a, a crop that will rival. No, this is someone sowing deliberate chaos and destruction. This is like someone coming and slashing tires or poisoning a water supply. The owner of the field says about this quite simply, an enemy did this. This parable is going to expand the notion and the possibility of an enemy. When Jesus is alone with his disciples, he leaves no doubt about who this enemy is. He says, the enemy who sows the weeds is the devil. And so Jesus' parable, especially with its interpretation, compels us to give the devil his due, as they say. We are fairly prone as modern-minded people to sort of dismiss the devil, to not give the devil his due, to sort of dismiss the idea or think it's sort of old-fashioned or antiquated or superstitious. But Jesus doesn't treat the notion of the devil that way. He gives the devil his due. And the work of the devil here is primarily in, in sowing a, a, a destructive crop that messes up the, the good work of the, the seed sown and the good message and the good crop is there. And it intermixes and intermingles with it and causes all kinds of trouble. Again, like the original parable, you can sort of scale this up and down. But um, you can scale this to the level of yourself as an individual and the degree to which other messages come into your heart and mind that compete and get mixed and mingled with the, the good news of grace and the good news of discipleship in Jesus. What are the other messages that come in? But you can, you can apply it in different ways, and, and maybe one important place to apply it is simply the level of the church. Some people have said, you know, the devil goes to church. The devil goes to church sowing disunity and discord and distraction. The church, not unlike our own hearts and lives, and not unlike the world as a whole, is, is a mixture of the blessed, the wondrous, the divine, and then also the demonic. This comes out in the open now and then when you get an abuse scandal that hits the church. 
or some crazy financial shenanigans where a bit by somebody is greedily trying to enrich themselves, or just the prideful contempt that can exist in a church body. Jesus' parable puts us on alert. Be alert for the work of the devil in your own heart and life, but in the life of the church. We remember Peter, who on that uh, key moment identified Christ and gave the great confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you are, you are Peter, a rock, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. And then just a moment later, Jesus decides to give Jesus a, a bit of suggestion that there's a better way, an alternative to the suffering of the cross. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You have Peter giving this divine confession of Jesus as the Christ, being, told that, being said that he'll be the rock in which Christ builds his church, and not a moment later, Jesus says his views are demonic and even satanic. Even Peter is a mixture, right? Of the good and the faithful and then the demonic. Jesus' parable puts us on alert. Key in this parable are, of course, what the enemy does is sows weeds. The evil one sows weeds, we are told. Now, the word for the, the bad seed, the weed seed here in Greek, is zizanion. I didn't know what that meant, and you probably don't either. But I looked it up, and it turns out that it's, it's, a, it's not just a general term. It's a quite specific term for a weed that closely resembles wheat. Let me give you some images to sort of back this up. Here are two different plants, the left and the right. One of them is, well, the weed plant, sometimes called the tares or darnel wheat. The other one is good wheat. It's pretty tough uh, to look at them in those images and know which is which, but I'll fill you in. On the left is lolium temulentum. I make no claim to getting that pronunciation right. And on the right is secale cereale. Now, you can see the word cereal in there. The one on the right is the one you want to make your cereal out of. Right? That's the good grain out of which you can make good bread and good things that, to eat. The one on the left, though, this lolium temulentum, um, though it looks very, very similar, especially in early stages, it is very, very different. It is actually poisonous. There were Roman laws that said if you went and sowed the seed on the left into somebody's field, you'd be punished. And if they had to have laws about it, that's probably because it happened from time to time, right? So Jesus' parable is not seem, does not seem to be especially um, far-fetched. Um, here's another image of them growing in a field, the one on the left and the one on the right, the bad on the left, the good on the right, and, well, honestly, they don't look very different. The difference only comes after they grow. You see the one on the left has that kind of alternating pattern of where the heads are, and the one on the right does not. You can only see the difference once the thing is fully grown. The key insight of Jesus drawing on this image seems to be this, evil what is evil, doesn't look like evil right away. It can look just like the good, sometimes for quite a long time. Evil can be difficult to distinguish from good, even in the church. The true disciples of Jesus and the false can look a lot the same on the outside. But as Jesus teaches elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, by their fruits you will finally know them. Finally, Jesus' uh, parable has put before us, um, see how it's added to a, a depth of the original parable. Now it has us thinking not only about what kind of soil is in my heart, but what kinds of different messages may be mixed in my heart and what kinds of different things and messages may be growing and sprouting in the world and in the church. Another key facet of this parable that's different than the original is the presence of these servants, these would-be helpful servants. They are shocked when they see it growing up and they see, they begin to see the difference between these two heads of grain and they say, oh no, what has happened? 
And they come and they ask a couple of really good questions. The first question they ask is, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? Where did it come from? That is the question of the the, uh, source of evil. Where does evil, where do the evil messages and the evil work of the devil, where does that ultimately come from? How did it, how does it get in and how does it get here? It's not an easy question to answer. Where did it come from? How did it get here? The answer given is that it's the work of an enemy. You have to take this enemy seriously. But then secondly, the servants asked, oh, okay, so then do you want us to go and pull them up? Shall we go into the field and find all the ones that look like the bad ones and and yank them up and yank them out? And the instruction given to them is is so important here. No. No, don't, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. You're going to have to let both grow together until the harvest. There's uh, important lessons for us here, too. Our resistance to what is evil. In the church, also in the world, is going to, by necessity, have a kind of gentleness and patience about it. We're going to see something that we're fairly convinced is evil, again, in our own lives, in the church, in the world, and we're going to, our first impulse very often will be like these would-be helpful servants. Well, let's go and rip it up. Tear it up by the roots. But Jesus cautions through this parable to be careful, first of all, that you don't put yourself in the place of judge and jury. Don't draw conclusions too quickly about what is evil. Maybe what's more important than hating what is evil is clinging to what is good. Love the good. Tend the good. Rage against the darkness if you must, but love the light even more. Hate any kind of cancerous presence that might invade the body of Christ, but hate it because you love the body of Christ. In this case, I suppose the best defense is a good offense. Love love deeply what is good. Love the good message of the kingdom. Love the words of Jesus, his call to grace and discipleship. And then wait and be patient. There was a key moment in church history where this parable came in. Uh, The details um, are beyond what I want to talk about today, but uh, it has to do with a group that was called the Donatists. This was in the early centuries of the church. And the Donatists came to really believe in the purity of the church. They said the church is supposed to be this bride of Christ that, as the Bible says, is without spot or wrinkle. And so what they wanted to do after the church had gone through some really difficult times They wanted to weed out from the church anybody and everybody who had sort of compromised their faith in some way. But it was was the church father, Augustine, who really stood up to them and resisted the Donatists, wrote against it, spoke against it. And part of what he emphasized especially was this particular parable, the parable of what's sometimes called the wheat and the tares. And the message that was proclaimed was this, be patient. The church is always a mixture of what is true and untrue until the end. Wait for the harvest. Um, John Calvin, Protestant reformer though he was, part of this Protestant breakaway from from the Roman Catholic Church of his day, saw Augustine's teaching and he saw this teaching of this parable. He said, we ought to separate from the church only in the case of dire, deep, intractable doctrinal reasons where the gospel itself is severely compromised. Other than that, we ought to wait and endure and acknowledge that the church will always be this mixed bag. Hearing, thinking about the Donatists and this parable in the recent uh, weeks, I thought also of more recent conversations about a group that's increasingly being called the Duns. Not the Donatists, but the Duns. Those who um, increasingly are, in, uh, especially in North America, are saying, well, I'm, I'm done with church. I'm done with church. I'm I'm not sure if I'm done with Jesus, but I'm done with the church. It's too, and then you can fill in the blank, right? Too hypocritical, too apathetic, uh, too too inwardly focused, uh, too lazy, too unhelpful, too irrelevant. And increasingly they are done. 
I, I don't like putting anybody in a box, really. To call them the duns is a move of a sociologist. But I have known people with those kind of questions and concerns, and, and you have too, I suspect. And it's hard to know how to respond to some of those criticisms because time and again, you have to sort of hear the criticism and say, yeah, yeah, if that's your experience, I mean, I can't really say otherwise. And, and the truth is, yeah, the church is always this mixed bag. The church can be so good and so beautiful, worshiping Christ and loving one another and loving neighbors in Jesus' name. But yeah, the church, the church is a mixed bag. We should be slow to judge just who is right and wrong and all that, and, and we should be patient and gracious with people. But we should also be slow to separate from a church body just because it's falling short of the mark. If we separate from it, then, then we're in some ways, again, making the premature judgment about how to separate out the wheat and the tares. So I'm concerned for folks who are the, the duns, I hope they're not done, certainly not done with Christ, and I hope not done with Christ's church. The outward forms of church may change and alter, but, but the church as the body of Christ, as the, the kingdom of his good work in the field of the world, that, that must go on, and it must continue. And it goes, and it continues under this call of the master in this parable, finally of Jesus, the son of man himself, to patience with that long work. Because finally, what he points us to is the harvest. This becomes the emphasis. Um, it's a little bit in the parable, as Jesus tells it at first. He mentions the harvest in the last couple of verses, but he really expands on the harvest notion in the interpretation of the parable. The emphasis in the parable itself seems to be on this intermixing of the wheat and the tares about the source of the, 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 the tares from this enemy, this evil one, and then the command to wait. But the focus of the interpretation turns to that day when the waiting will be ended. When the weeds and the wheat will, will finally and forever be, be separated out. Take you back again to that image of the heads of grain. Jesus calls for a, a great deal of patience, but there does come a day when you can finally and forever tell the difference. And Jesus says that at the harvest, at the end of the age, it will happen. The wheat and the tares will be sorted. Not unlike Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goats, there will be a sifting and a sorting that happens at the end of time. That it is ensured to happen at the end of time can help us to be make sure we don't prematurely put ourselves in the seat of the one to judge exactly who is in and who is out and who is good and who is evil and who is truly following Christ and who might be sowing seeds of discord. In the interpretation, Jesus uh, points in verse 41 to those who cause others to sin. That really is the tares, those who cause others to stumble and to lose faith. This would be especially on those who have roles of leading and teaching in the faith. That if we cause others to stumble by our lives, then, then we are acting like the tares. He speaks of those who do evil also. And this has an ongoing, continuous sense to it. Those who have not repented of doing evil. This is not to say that any one of us doesn't have some lingering sin in our lives that we've repented of and, and seek to resist. But, but if as a person, even if we're in the mix of the church, but we have not fundamentally repented of our sin, if we continue in sin without repentance, then, then we are the tares. Jesus says that those who cause to sin and those who sin in ongoing, unrepentant ways will be, will be like those who are thrown out. He says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Expressions of profound, profound regret. We have missed out. We have missed out on the grace and goodness of God. Jesus' parable and its interpretation then contain both words of caution and warning, and a call to be alert, but also a call towards patience and to comfort. Ultimately, this world and this field is in the good, wise, loving hands of a good one who sows the seed, of a, a master who knows what he's doing, a true master farmer who in the end will be the one 
capable of overseeing the harvest. This should, as Jesus' disciples, give us a good deal of comfort, should call us to patience, to, to of course, seek to root out from our own hearts and lives any sinful tendencies and any evil messages that have taken root, and to look about us and around us and be alert and attentive to the work of the evil one and to, to wait at times to see the fruit of things before we make any judgments. I read uh, a little bit from a sermon from Helmut Tielica as a German pastor. This is in the post-World War II moment in Germany. And what was uh, the church in Germany at that time was really wrestling with was all the ways in which the church had been complicit with this horrific project of, of Nazism. And there was a, a denazification of the church that was necessary in many places, and indeed it needed to happen. There was a strong desire in many instances to sort of start from scratch and eliminate anyone and everyone who had been complicit or compromised in any way. And Tilika preaches in light of that on this particular parable. And he asks some pointed questions. Let me just read from that sermon a little bit. He says, have we ever in our life met a person, no matter how depraved, unbelieving, or vicious he may have been, even some malicious, quarreling, clacking neighbor, or a slippery, scheming fellow worker, he says, I ask you, have we ever met a person of whom we dared to say, this person is really a weed and nothing but a weed? He says, or were we not at the same time brought up short and challenged to see that Jesus died for him too? And that none of us can know whether God may not still have something in mind for him, whether some altogether different seed may yet spring up in him. Would not our hand wither if we were to root him out as a weed? Must not this hand draw back and perhaps open in a gesture of blessing and prayer that God may yet bestow his mercy upon this seemingly lost and condemned failure? It's a beautiful expression. If our hand is quick to reach out and seek to uproot anyone, to name and declare their final judgment, then maybe we should be slow and patient and extend that hand rather in a gesture of uh, blessing and prayer. I take that as a good place for us to go to just that, a place of prayer and blessing, that we may receive Jesus' word and that it may bear good fruit in us. Let's go to God together in prayer. God, our Father, we pray that you would plant your word deep in us to shape and fashion us, to make us wise and discerning and patient and gracious. For you have been patient and gracious towards us. Lord, may the good news of a good sower of the seed, the Son of Man, a good master, a good farmer, one who oversees the growth of all things. May that comfort us deeply. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, the one who told us this story and who embodied it to the full and who lays his life on the line that we might be saved. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to respond today both in testimony and in song, but in testimony first, uh, drawing on words from the Our World Belongs to God testimony, words that speak of God's revelation through his word. So I invite you to join me where indicated. Here's how it begins. It says, God gives this world many ways to know him. The creation shows his power and majesty. He speaks through prophets, poets, and apostles, and most eloquently through the Son. The spirit active from the beginning moved human beings to write the word of God and opens our hearts to God's voice. Together, the Bible is the word of God, the record and tool of his redeeming work. It is the word of truth, breath of God, fully reliable in leading us to know God and to walk with Jesus Christ in new life. The Bible tells the story of God's mighty acts in the unfolding of covenant history. As one revelation in two testaments, the Bible reveals God's will and the sweep of God's redeeming work. Illumined and equipped by the Spirit, disciples of Jesus hear and do the word. 
witnessing to the good news that our world belongs to God, who loves it deeply. And so let's respond in song, singing, Our God Will Go Before Us. I invite you to rise as able as we sing. It's a good word. Our God will go before us. The Lord of hosts is with us. Go with that promise and blessing this week and receive the blessing of Almighty God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you now and forevermore his abiding peace. Amen.